whose Warwick Farm in northern Sandown attracted the cream of the world's Grand Prix drivers and some of the largest crowds ever drawn to any Australian sporting event at the time. World champions John Surtees, Jim Clark, Graham Hill and our own Jack Brabham all raced here in the year that they won their world titles and in cars which reflected the latest international technology. On the surface, Australian motor racing was in great shape. But was it really? For every international track they built, it seemed, another club circuit disappeared. Mount Druitt, Nublar, Catalina Park. While the established drivers were having a field day, the nursery grounds were being ploughed under. In 1961, a group of concerned amateurs found a likely-looking cow pasture outside Camden, and with the help of its owner Dan Cleary, they built the most rudimentary of one-mile tracks. On Sunday, February 18, 1962, Oran Park opened for business. They ran 18 races that day, twice the number of some of the bigger circuits. The longest race was just 12 miles, and the fastest car on the track wasn't a Lotus or a Cooper, but a near-to-homemade motor, powered by a 1,000cc four-cylinder Ford. Well, and what was the first meeting like? Very, very rough. The track was, from my memory, wasn't even sealed. It was all sealed dirt. And uh, most competitors broke their windscreen. And I can remember now that they refunded our entry money to pay for the windscreens. Well, when you went on from the Morris Minor you raced at the first meeting to race very successfully in the early model Holdens. That's correct, John. I raced early model Holdens for about five or six years and went on to an EH after that. But you never really hit the, the great heights like the Gagans. What happened? I would say financial assistance mainly stopped me. I was only a battler. When I first started racing, I was only an apprentice. Is it different now? I mean, could you get back into motor racing now and fund it? I'd like to think that I could. I, I'd like to think that I haven't lost a touch I had, you know. Designed purely for the enjoyment of the club racer, and in terms of track service barely adequate for the task, the first meeting attracted almost 2,000 paying spectators. To the onlooker's delight, they found that for almost a third of the track's distance, they could stand so close to the action that they could be sprayed with gravel and go home with tyre shreds in their hair. Quite unwittingly, the park had struck on a magic formula, a combination of traditional motor racing with the flair of speedway. With the promise of the big time before it, it took just two years for the nursery track to cast off its diapers. In late 1963, the original promoters, the Singer Car Club, became the far more appropriately named New South Wales Road Racing Club. And the track grew another corner, Enigal, now Castrol, putting spectators virtually in the driver's seat. But there were some seats it was best not to be in. At only his second meeting, this young man inverted his Holden-powered MGTC over the dogleg, rolling almost into Enigal. Dragged from the wreck and spitting front teeth, the aggressive young Wyong pastry cook gasped, Get the car on its wheels, I want to get going. And then he collapsed. His name, of course, was Alan Grice. The big time did come to Warren Park. From 1963 to 1967, the lap record seesawed between two all-time greats, Frank Matic in his Lotus 19 sports car and Leo Gagan in a succession of Lotus open wheelers. Matic opened batting with a 49 second lap and the record tumbled to 46.4 before two other drivers, Neil Allen and the Holden dealer team's John Harvey, entered the fray. In 1972, Matic took it back again, a sensational 39 second lap in his own Matic A50. So quick was the time that the record stood for 11 years before Andrew Medici shaved just one tenth of a second off it to leave it at 38.9. But sports cars and open wheelers weren't the big news of Oran Park. It was touring cars. As early as 1964, Pete Gagan's Lotus Cortina and a clutch of F.J. Holden's brought spectators cramming to the fences. Totally innovative, or plagiarising speedway depending on your viewpoint, the park introduced night racing in 1966 and put the local drive-in movies out of business. Big, fire-breathing series production cars were driven by the new stars, John Goss, Fred Gibson, Bob Morris. John Goss, what was it like racing the big Falcons and other car, touring cars of the early 70s? I suppose it was always a lot of fun, Will, and uh, in many ways it's not unlike what we're doing here today, but uh, basically they were production cars. We had fairly serious limitations with uh, tyres, but um, 
although we, when I look back on, on it, I think it was fun, we were pretty serious about it at the time, and so it meant that we were looking for those one hundredths of a second. I can remember a day here, Will, when Alan Moffat and myself were separated by one one hundredth of a second for the one hundred mile final of the Toby Lee series. So that'll give you some idea of what it was like. Legends were made every meeting. When Bob Morris lost a wheel at Sutton's Corner, he ploughed on, not for one, but for two laps, with flames shooting from the wheel well and the crowd on fire. The support races weren't bad either. A young Victorian ex-army conscript who shoehorned a Holden engine into his Austin A30 caught the eye of the park's manager, Alan Horsley. Unheard of in its day, Horsley offered the youngster travelling money to bring the car over the border. And Peter Brock's career received a much needed boost. Alan, what sort of help did you give Peter Brock? We gave Peter a contract to come to Sydney and race at Iron Park, I think, for a period of 12, of 12 months. Uh, it was in the form of money. I'm not sure how much nowadays. It wouldn't have been too much. Well, that was uh, something fairly unusual because I thought Iron Park's policy was not to pay starting money. Oh, I think it was everybody's policy in those days, John, but uh, Peter, even way back in those days, we discovered him in Witten and he had something special and uh, we decided to bring him up here and of course he's gone on from there. What other people did you help? Oh there were a lot of guys, uh, Alan Moffat, uh, I can remember Alan couldn't afford an engine at one stage and we helped him out with that. Uh, there are a number, Barry Sharp I can remember from the sports sedan days where we uh, you know, bought the body shells for them and there were, there were a lot of drivers back in those early days. By the early 70s Oren Park dominated New South Wales motor racing. With the Australian Jockey Club unwilling to invest in its Warwick Farm complex, even the Australian Touring Car Championship defected to the park. In 1971, the touring car clash between Alan Moffat and Bob Jane bought 33,000 paying customers and page one coverage from the Sydney press. Jane won the race, but Moffat won the crowd. Big Al took reverse when he should have found second at Sutton's and his fight back to catch, but not past Bob, became a contemporary classic. In 1974, Oren Park extended once again. A 2.6 kilometre Grand Prix track was added, putting eight extra corners onto the track, but disappointingly reducing passing opportunities and slowing the lap average by more than 30 kilometres an hour. Hard on brakes and testing on suspension the new circuit was a logical place for the two ground masters, Jack Brabham and Sterling Moss, to test their Tirana prior to their somewhat embarrassing return to the world stage in the 1976 James Hardy 1000. Jammed in gear on the starting line, Brabham was tail shunted and his race was Gagan, and beat you back in the old day today. Yes, John. It uh, feels quite good to be here and, uh, and of course, in the old girl. How much changed to her from uh, as you remember? Ah, oh, she's not changed all that much now. No, she's still there. It, uh, it just sort of feels a, a little bit uh, um, uh, wobbly, I suppose. But that's uh, the suspension of of in her um, era isn't sort of quite up with the, with the uh, suspensions of t t t t today. But I think all in all, she's she's, she's all there still. You've got a chance today, of course, to find out what modern suspension's like. You're driving in the Commodore Classic. Yes, yes, I was uh, yeah. always posed. 40 kilometres. Eight, eight, talking of... ...promoters of Oren Park to, um, to have... ...and uh, I uh, took it And Ian Gagan round the track in that Mustang. A car in which he raced 74 times. He took victory on 69 occasions, an unbelievable record. He set lap records at 14 circuits, and to me, even more remarkable than that was that at Bathurst, where today cars in the James Hardy are lapping at, what, low 220s, he, what, nearly 20 years ago, lapped at 226. That car had 470 horsepower and like the Dalro Jaguar, although most were based on the MGTC. In England at the same time, John Cooper was proving that rear-engined racing cars had many advantages over front-engined ones. It didn't take Colin Chapman long to follow his example with the Lotus 18. It didn't take Aussie designers long to do the same. Bob Joas in Sydney was one of many Aussie engineers who built small numbers of racing cars, in this case, five Jolluses. Coopers quickly graduated from being spindly learner cars powered by motorcycle engines to Grand Prix cars powered by four-cylinder Coventry Climax motors. 
A brilliant and fertile mind of Colin Chapman was constantly turning out new lotuses, always with the emphasis on lightweight and efficiency, epitomised here by the 23B sports car. A great Australian, Phil Irving, headed a small team that designed a series of V8 engines that achieved remarkable success. They were the crowning glory of Brabham cars, set up in 1961 by Jack Brabham and Ron Toronac. Leo Gordou, for both safety reasons, but also to let him have a run in the race. Mind you, the other drivers wouldn't be too pleased because these whole engines must be getting close to boiling in the hot oil bike temperature. Flags out. Some Dana creeping in the Lotus 49 and he gets a great start. Marshall just about stalls it, hangs onto it. Walks uh, Peter Sims in the Repco Brabham similar car, BT23. But it's Dawson Damon now down the inside. He's overtaken by Paul Hamilton, the hill climb driver in the Elfin 600. Hamilton, a regular motorsport competitor some years ago. Dawson Damon, very much an amateur. Amateur farmer from the, the property next door to Warren Park. Gentleman businessman. Ken Sparks there in the bright yellow Lotus 23 sports car mixing with mostly open wheelers. Hamilton over the dog leg for the first time. The Elfin sitting right up on its suspension and then settling down and now very much nose down on the track under heavy brakes. The Formula One Lotus. Then 33 from the outside of the second row. Rick Ottens in third place. 52.63, the standing start lap. Hamilton just 1,600 cc's versus 3 litres of Ford Cosworth power and the Lotus 49 behind him. There it is, John Dawson Damer. Then comes Rick Ott in the South Australian built Elfin Monocoque, first monocoque chassis built in Australia. And regarded a very pretty car at its time, Dawson Damer's Lotus 49, the first Formula One car to appear the Dutch Grand Prix in 1967 with the Ford Formula One 3 litre V8, the Cosworth V8 that had been developed for their Ford Formula Two engine and it won 155 bronze trees. Lotus had exclusive use of it early on. Hamilton gets very sideways. Lotus had exclusive use of this engine and one of its great fortes, apart from the way it performed and the way it went, the ongoing development that went into the motor was that it was a stressed part of the, of the car so that the engine bolted behind the driver and then the suspension was hung off the back of the engine. Hamilton though doing a very good job throwing his car about very hard to stay ahead of it in, in a car that really wouldn't live with it normally as Paul Marshall's in a lot of trouble in car one. Two and a half litres of Repco Brabham Power V8 and he's getting it all over the track. And he better not do too much uh, damage to it because I believe it's been sold at Burma Seller School, Bid School, and will head to the States. Rather like the, uh, let's have a look at this. This is the car that Bib Stilwell, formerly Vice President of Learjet Corporation, motor dealer in Victoria before he moved to America and rancher farmer over there now, um, paid nearly $220,000 for a D-type Jaguar and now has bought car number one. Some name is saying um, as he gets fairly close now, but he's being threatened too, it's Bill Marshall making up ground from that near lose when he came right to this section of circuit. He's a bit iffy there again. Only 1.12 seconds separates these top three cars as Dawson Damer has a tentative look down the outside. In fact, he is stroking that Lotus 49 along very easily. He's got a lot of power. If he's got the lowest tune for Cosworth uh, Formula One engine, he would have 370 horsepower. And if he's got it in the last form, the short stroke Formula One Cosworth engine that last appeared only a few years ago in Formula One, well then he'd have nearly 550 horsepower. Tremendous development that went on in that engine through Keith Duckworth, its designer, through the life of the motor. And of course it went on and became a successful Le Mans 24 hour car. It is the engine for Indy and it now goes back to third place as Hamilton with the Australian designed and built Repco engine in the back, two and a half litres, just overtaking the three litre Formula One motor in the Lotus. 
point seven of a second. After Paul Hamilton. From Marshall back to Hamilton. Two laps remaining. And the 1600cc Formula 2 car rolled out the might of the two and a half litre Repco Brabham. <laughs> Wonderfully spindly car there, and the driver using the mirrors very well as Hamilton hits the lead. So, it is the Jack Brabham, Ron Torinac designed Brabham car with the Phil Irving Repco designed engine in the back, two and a half litres, so in Australian Tasman formula. As specification, two and a half litres, where Formula One was three litres at the time. It's now in the lead. And that was a motor Formula Junior, so the old blue car. So, a, a car designed by Englishman Guy Buckingham, built in Sydney. He built many cars where the top car and Paul Hamilton top. He's in third place as Dawson Damer pounces through. So it's Hamilton now in car one from Dawson Damer in car 49 in second place and then Hamilton third in car two. And coming round now, they're on their final lap. Let's and have you, a look at it. Front saw, locked up. And you saw just a flash of Marshall's car, or rather of Dawson Damer's car in front of him as Hamilton tried to get past on the outside, of Marshall rather, and uh, couldn't do it. And now on their final lap, halfway through it, nine laps completed. Coming up to a checkered flag, and here we go, the winner of the 10 lap silver anniversary trophy race for historic cars is Dr. Bill Marshall in the Brabham BT31 from the honorary John Dawson Damer in the Lotus 49 second and Paul Hamilton in the Elfin 600 in third position. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed it is. Letting everyone know what he thinks about it. Former rally navigator, of course, for Colin Bond. In fact, former Australian champion rally navigator. Indeed. That's the man that did the job, recovering very well from a half lose. And what a piece of Australian history we're looking at. That was all Australian-inspired design and technology and ingenuity and engineering answers that took on the world and beat the world with the Brabham car and the Repco V8 engine. So the results to the Commodore. The FJ had a bench seat, three-speed column change, a small six-cylinder engine and drum brakes all round. It was a credit to its drivers that they ever kept them pointed in the right direction. With luck, determination and the following wind, they finally did 200 kilometres an hour in sprint races at Bathurst. The Commodore, by comparison, has a much smaller frontal area. Being lower, it's also much more stable at speed. But the biggest improvements in this 30 years of development are in the suspension, tyres, brakes and steering. They not only do 260 kilometres an hour in a straight line at Bathurst, but they're faster through the corners, they brake later and they get the power on out of corners much earlier. There's also much more of it, nearly 400 horsepower from the 5 litre Commodore V8. That's a very sophisticated and complex unit compared with the 2.2 litre six cylinder of the FJ. Tuned for racing mainly with extra carburetors, a better exhaust system and enlarging the engine to as much as 2.6 litres, they gave 170 horsepower. Ready to race, not even with its own trailer, just an A-bar to pull it along behind a tow car, it cost a thousand pounds, two thousand dollars. And I reckon they had as much fun in those days as the people today spending $100,000 on a Group A Commodore. In 19... Position, six cylinders, a meagre three litres against the American V8. Australia's image car of the same period. Legs up, ready to go. And they're racing. Then John gets all the power of the Mustang down. Car seven is away on the inside, but looking to play for six on the outside, trying to challenge him. But just look at the muscle of this big Mustang pony car. Mass of the age hole that sorts themselves out behind him. Lynn Tot is on occasion spun the car. He spun an earlier race today when leading and lost the race. A lot of power from these Mustangs, something like 470 from Pete Gagan's car, this one similar. 
one stage in Australia, about five of them racing, Bob Jane, Norm Beachy, Ian Gagan among them. The E.H. Holdens, look at them, embrace of them, out chasing the big heavy bigger six of the Valiant, and then the 1.3 litre Mini, quite a number of them, Lindsay Dyer heading the bunch. Great drivers drove E.H. Holden's, Kevin Bartlett locally, 80 miles an hour, 140 kilometres an hour, on three wheels at Bathurst, one front wheel missing, but Brian Muir, who went to England, British Salute car champion, drove at Le Mans, cut his teeth on F.J. and then E.H. Holden's. Indication of just how the lap times are comparing here, in 1970, Big Gagan held the lap deck well, round or and five short circuit of 50 seconds neat in his Ford Mustang. Ray Linktoff's pole position yesterday was set at a 52.29. So the age of the car is showing. Second position, Trevica hits the cement dust down the main straight. Played by several of the historic cars which are racing here today. Then this is Holden E.H. Charges into third place. Valiant, a very much heavier engine. Not really a very free revving engine, but with an enormous mid-range power and torque. Heading the two E.H.'s. And we're Holden in the period, and indeed over most of this post-war Australian motor racing period persevered with the company's involvement in motor racing. Chrysler got very nervous and got out just when the car really through the paces and the charges were coming good. Lintop in the meantime, a 1.9 second advantage over the second place car, the Valiant. And Dyer down into third place. One could have said it was a do or die attempt. But could have. And 89 back to fourth place, John Medley. Sorry, that's not right. That's been bitter in fact. Yes. as you can towards the fence, working on the principle that if you do lose it, you turn only a little kiss of the fence rather than a monstrous big accident when the car spins into it. Four remaining for Dyer, trying to get away from Trevica, trying to make ground on Linton, but what a massive difference. He's down one gear, he's only got three forward gears compared to four on the Mustang. He's down two litres, he's got three compared to five in the Mustang. But he does have front disc brakes. What an innovation. And the second hold of tries to use them to affect my jeans car. Yeah, this uh, nearly biffed the Valiant. He very nearly bent on him for a little bit of extra braking. So the Holden car, I would say that's what Valiants were built for. He uses braking markers for Holden. Most of the action was over because this had already done it, but there he comes in again and just look at that stadium sideways, tyre smoking. And I'd suggest that Steve Trevica has had more fun in that corner than the race leader Ray Lintod has had all of it long. Well, it's where well, Lintod did spin earlier uh, in an earlier race. Coming up now to complete lap eight, which gives Lintod in one corner's time two remaining dyers in second place. Dire straits in terms of getting to the front. Eight completed now by Lintock. And about five seconds in arrears, Dyer in second. About a second back to Trevika third.
less than that to fourth place Visa and tail end of the field taking the leader off or forcing the leader to go off circuit Did you see what else he forced off though? He forced off the Galaxy 500 absolutely yeah. superb wonderful old car And they race, don't laugh, quite quickly in their own day. There's the Galaxy. That car was actually driven by a man who used to drive them in the good old days, Ken Brignan, if you remember. Yes, Ken Brignan went very honestly indeed. And that was Brignan in that car. Well, Alan Barrow was racing at FJ here. There he is. Green with a deeper green strut, FJ. And uh, Barrow raced them. They were in their heyday as Dyer forces his way onward, hanging on to second place, doing very well. The, the car that sold the most of any GMH or any whole.